Welcome to the Lit Lounge. I'm Mocha Ochoa, and I'm here at the MLK Library in Washington, D.C. in the Grand Reading Room. It's National Poetry Month, and we are so excited to bring to you none other than Professor, Auntie, Mother, <laughs> Grand Divine Feminine, Sonia Sanchez, with her new book, Collected Poems by Sonia Sanchez. Here, um so, so, so honored to have uh, Professor Sonia Sanchez, um, mother, auntie. Um, you, you have been such uh, comfort to us women, um, Black people all around the world. Um, and, and especially at, in this time, uh, women, it's, all, it's always wonderful to have women come in and kind of soothe us mm -hmm. and then give us instructions to move forward. Thank so we're you. so honored to have you here. It's an honor to be here. You know, yesterday, April 9th, was a Paul Robeson's birthday. And I was with Danny Glover uh, on uh, Zoom, uh, where um, in, uh, in LA at one of the theater companies, they did um, a piece about Brother Robeson. And um, can I read to you what I read? Uh, that? Right. Um, and just, uh, there's, a, there's an amazing book. There is this amazing picture yeah. of Robeson, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Stories from the Paul Robeson house, right? You know? Um, and in it um, uh, is a CD and just really amazing. And I'm sitting in Robeson's room in the his rocking chair, can oh, you see it? Oh yes, 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 right. And I just stayed in there uh, before I I I talked, you know, just to to feel the place and 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 hear it, the place, right? Um, I'd like to begin with a poem for Paul Robeson. It's a tanka. Your face like summer lightning gets caught in my voice and i draw you up from deep rivers taste your face of a thousand names see you smile a new season hear your voice a wild sea pausing in the wind that's that's how i always felt brother robeson you know um um my dad brought us from Birmingham, Alabama to a place called New York City when I was eight years old. At the beginning of the 50s, we woke up one Saturday morning. My dad said, do your chores and you can spend the whole day at the movies. Can you imagine spending the whole day? There, there were about seven of us at the movies. And we did that and we came back home. My dad was waiting outside. He said, I want you to meet someone, Pat. Sonia, and we walked into our apartment. There was this very tall man with some other men in there. It was Paul Robeson. My father had spent given up the my father had given up the apartment for the day. That was during the time when, you know, people were following him around a great deal. And I remember looking up at this man. And he patted me on my shoulder and shook my hand. We knew who he was because, you know, my dad had his records, but it was such a wonderful moment. And to think that years later, you realize that you gave up your apartment for the day so he could have a meeting. And that was really quite exciting. He was an activist and he was one of the first people when I saw him perform, that he not only performed, but he talked the way we do now. He sang a song, then he talked in between about what was going on in the world, what was happening in the world, how people should respond to it. And then he went to another song. If you see me read, I read a poem, and then I talk about the poem, why I wrote that poem, what's going on in the world, whatever. We learned that indeed, just as the song was his weapon, the poem was our weapon, my weapon. You see, 
He taught us all how to be activists and very much loyal to ourselves. When I first moved here in 76 in Philadelphia, I was told that Robeson was here. People in New York told me and they said, go see him, Sonia. And I finally got a number and I called his house and they said he wasn't doing well, but they would let me know when I might be able to see him. And of course I didn't, you know, he died. And I, what I wanted to say to him, I wanted to hold his hands and say, thank you. Thank you for fighting that battle for all of us. Thank you for being a man of such bravery and a man of such vision. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So that was a piece that I read uh, about Brother Paul Robeson on his birthday, um, um, which it comes April 9th, you know? Um, and it was uh, uh, um, um, oh. a great, a great, they did a, a play uh, with uh, Danny Glover as one of the actors about Robeson uh, talking to some of his uh, friends and, and talking about what they were doing and what was going on in the world and their role and not being able to leave the country past what's been picked up, you know, all those kinds of things. And it brought back that aura um, of what was going on uh, with these men and women who were so progressive, who stepped out, you know, they stepped out on the edge of the world and there was no nothing there to catch them but each other. Right. And, they, and each one caught the other ones. Come on, Paul, we can do this, you know. You know, come on, man, you can do this, you know. Come on, sister, we can do this, you know. Uh, and um, I, I am just so thrilled, you know, that um, Danny called me and asked me to be a part of that uh, yesterday. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And when you speak, it reminds me you know, they, they say that uh, the movement you were involved with, the uh, Black Arts Movement, uh, Harlem Writers Guild, um, that, that that was the second renaissance, that you all inspired that. Um, did you, has he, had he, because you met him at such a young age, had he always been inspiration to you? Right. Well, we met him. And then I, as I said, my father was a school teacher and a musician. He's in the Alabama um, Jazz Hall of Fame, you know, because they were the first jazz musicians in a place called Alabama. Can you imagine? Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, uh, so we always had music in our house, you know. Uh, I mean, we always had jazz and we always had uh, Billie Holiday, you know, and Dinah Washington, uh, Ella Fitzgerald, you know, uh, you know, uh, all these people, uh, you know, we, we heard uh, their songs. So, yes. Um, and we also heard Paul Robeson, you know, and if by chance Paul Robeson was on the idiot box when we finally got a television, you know, uh, you know, uh, we would run and sit and it, it was, it became a, our houses, you know, uh, in the same fashion we heard Malcolm, right. And brother Martin, uh, you know, our houses became a sacred place. Um, you know, when they went off, you know, uh, their voices, uh, uh, resonated in the house, you know, and, you know, for the rest of the day, nobody acted the fool, you know, you can't act the fool when you have that residue of, of brilliance and, and that residue of, um, of love that, came from robes and singing and talking and Malcolm talking and brother Martin talking, you know, you know, and all the great, great uh, people of that period, you know, saying to Jimmy Bourbon on, on the idiot box also to talking, you know, you felt like I can conquer the world as you sat there and listened to them. So it, it was a great, great education, you know, for all of us. Um, um, uh, that was a joy um, coming into uh, the sixties, um, and when, and Brother Baraka, uh, being in the village when Martin was assassinated, came up to Harlem, you know, and he and Larry Neal will begin uh, the Black Arts Repertory Theater, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, where we will all go and meet, uh, where I will see um, uh, uh, a beautiful sister uh, uh, say, give a speech, who will revere the Black woman? Whoa. 
Abby Lincoln did that, right, to about 60 Black women on one Sunday afternoon. And the sun was retreating, and the sun kind of came into that room and left this shadow of light. And that light went across Sister Abby's face, whatever. And it was like magic, you know. And I leaned back on my eyes, my dear sister, you know, and just listened to her give this talk who would revere the Black woman. Who wouldn't? No one ever talked about anyone revering the black woman, my dear sister. And there we were, you know, caught, caught, you know, in her web of beauty, whatever. And when we all stood up and went up and hugged her and thanked her, whatever, we all walked out, you know, together, you know, in a web of beauty. We knew that we were these beautiful black women. We knew what we had to do, how we had to hold. We knew that we could never act a fool on the stage, in a hallway, in the streets, you know, in our homes, whatever, because, you know, we were those women that she was talking about, right? And um, Black World published that 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 talk. You can get it from there, you know, go online and, and you know, and get it. Uh, but it was a magical moment for, for many of us, uh, you know, period. Yeah. Right. So, you know, um, I, this is one thing I want to um, also make sure that we touch on that a lot of people may not realize, but, you know, in your poetry, you repeat, you're known for repeating a lot of words. Mm -hmm. And it's an ode to um, uh, something that you dealt with as a child. A lot mm -hmm. of people may not know that Sonia Sanchez, I'm used to stutter. Yeah. Isn't it amazing how many writers, Black women writers, had a problem with speech, you know, um, you know, from Audre Lorde um, to Maya, who didn't speak until a certain age, right, you know, um, uh, to the young uh, poet laureate who gave the speech for the inauguration. She also, I'm always so surprised and I always go up and um, people always come up and tell me the same thing, you know, like, oh, you know, I had this problem. So it's amazing that we would then write and then go up on stage. The first time I read with Baraka and Larry Neal, and there was another person there, I can't remember the person, and they called me and said, would you come and uh, initiate this stage, right? I remember it was downstairs. I think it was in, uh, in, 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 in the basement of a church. I don't remember where it was or a cultural center. And I said, sure. And then after I said, I thought, oh my God, I've never read my poetry out loud. Right. But I got there and I went backstage and someone went out before me and then Larry was running the show and he introduced me and I said, I, I can't do that. Uh, no one knew I studied because when, before I spoke, I would like say it all in my head and then say it slowly. So no one knew whatever. But I knew if I were to pick up a piece of paper and read a poem that like it would be pure unadulterated hell at that point. And he said to me, he literally, they, they had closed the curtain. And as he opened the curtain, he pushed me out. And, you know, like I got up and there I am looking at these people. Right. So I picked up the. Uh, I had the poem in my hand. I went da dun 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 da dun 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 I read it fastly fast, so there was no time for a stutter. I figured if I read it fast enough, there would be no time for a stutter to escape. Right? I went and I was at the end and I walked off the stage. So, you know, and people clapped, you know, and I'm saying, My God, what are they clapping for? Then I said to Larry, Was that okay? And Larry was directing everything. He said, you know, he said, what'd you say, Sonia? I said, was, was that okay? Was that okay? He said, yeah, you were good. What are you getting, a big head or something? And I realized I had done it. So all I had to do was practice that, practice that poem before I said it, right? Uh, you know, learn how, like uh, the president, our new president, I knew he was a stutterer, an ex-stutterer by the way that he spoke. Remember how he could not, in a sense, grab onto words. And I said to my family once when I first heard him speak, he need to uh, uh, breathe. You know, he needs to, to, to divide up his words, uh, say no more than four or five words at a time and then breathe and then say no more than that. Four. That's you know, Someone should have taught him that, whatever. Um, and uh, even when I, I hear him doing that, at some making that mistake, I want to say, take a deep breath, you know, only 
only put in your throat three or four words, that's all you can hold with that stutter, right? And then when you breathe, the stutter is not there and then go to do three or four more and then hold your breath and whatever, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, and it was your love of poetry so that that got you to overcome that, um, well, yeah. You mean yeah. say it's an impediment? It's, it's, yeah, well, it's, yeah, well, you know, whatever it was. Well, I began to stutter after my grandmother died, who yeah. took care of me as my mother, you know, so I, I was not born a stutterer, you know. Uh, when I would go to other places for my sister and us to stay, they would say, my sister was so beautiful. And they said, oh, isn't she beautiful? And then they say, with me to go, uh, 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 you know, whatever. But I didn't mind because I, as long as I had a book and I was reading, I didn't mind. And also the stutter protected you. Nobody bothered you. You know, no one wants to bother a stutterer. You know what I mean? You know, no one wants to. Uh, so therefore, I was left alone, you know, to to read and 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 do what I wanted to do, actually, in a sense. Right. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. My old, my oldest daughter um, who's in college now. She was as well um, until maybe sometime in high school. Mm -hmm. And she's a great writer. Yeah. So, Isn't that amazing? Yeah. But I think also you, your 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 mind and your tongue and your voice becomes a gatherer of words because even when you're stuttering, you can hear the, you know, the words that you want to say. And so it's like a, it's almost like your tongue becomes a memory bank. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and so at some point, you know, uh, I write everything down longhand. Um, and, uh, and so there you would be and you would go back and you look at it, but it also, uh, one of the reasons why I think I learned how to read well is I was at NYU when I graduated from Hunter. I was taking some grad classes, and then one of the classes I took was a, a poetry class taught by Louise Bogan, the great American poet. Um, and she was an, an editor for one of the, the, the huge uh, magazines in New York. And, uh, you know, what I uh, would do is that I would practice uh, uh, my poems, you know, uh, there was no, it's like when I was in school um, uh, in New York City, like, you know, uh, and you know how you, we were doing pro, uh, uh, um, like problems in math or problems in English, where you had to, to read a sentence and then tell where it was a verb and where it was a predicate, whatever, et cetera. Well, I would count the people before me and I would say, I'm the 10th one. So I would go to the 10th one. I'm not even listening to the rest of it, right? And I do it, uh, da, 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 da. and so by the time it got to me, I knew how to say it. I had practiced it, you know. It is always about practicing at some point. Um, uh, and I would practice it to a point, but I also learned how to do it slowly, whatever. And then there I was, and I had the success. But Louise Bogan also told us that we needed to practice reading our poetry. So therefore, I always practice my poetry, yeah. And it was poetry that took you out to the West Coast, um, or, or your teaching, actually, that took you out to the right. West Coast? Right. Yeah, uh, they needed, um, uh, I had gotten some, some words from um, a San Francisco State um, 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 uh, uh, what, what they called the, the, uh, the Black uh, the, the Black Studies was, was beginning at that time, right? Um, they had the Black st uh, Student Union there, right? Um, they, uh, I was I was in Mexico because the thing had happened had had uh, become dissolved the Black Arts uh, because of uh, some of the the people who 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 did not like what was going on, and so I was in Mexico and I I heard these people calling me. I was walking down El Paseo de la Re Reforma in Mexico, and I heard someone said Sanchez Sanchez, and it was uh, Jimmy Gar Garrett and and uh, Charles Sizemore. Uh, they were in. Um, uh, at, at San Francisco State. And they said, we've been calling you and calling you. We want you to come out. They got off the, the bus and they stayed with me the rest of the day. We've been calling you. We want you to come out to San Francisco State and teach in, we're starting something called Black Studies. And I said with my smart mouth, every time we do something called Black, it gets destroyed by somebody comes and begins to destroy it. I said, I doubt it seriously if I'm going to California. You know, Reagan was the, the governor 
<laughs> at the time, right? And I said, I, plus I have a rent control apartment in New York City. You do not give up a rent control apartment. But anyway, they stayed, they came to, to the city. Uh, I, went, I came back home to New York to teach. And they called and said they were coming to New York. Would I take them to see Larry Neal and, and, and um, uh, Baraka, right? And I said, sure. Uh, and I took them over to New Jersey. And we all set up that night talking about the possibilities of teaching Black and Latinos and people of color about themselves, right? In a Black studies program, what a difference that would make in a university, in a college, right? And I got all inspired and I said to them, yes, I will come, right? Baraka said, yes, I will come, you know, um, and, uh, and, and we did. We went out there. Baraka came out and did the cultural part. He was part of the cultural wing of the Black Studies, right? And that's how I met Danny. Danny came back from, from he was an older person in the service. He came back to take our, take, uh, take our courses. I mean, I taught him, right? But what's, what's important is that he hooked on to Baraka at that time, right? And he began to act. You know, and he was an actor and he also had a problem speaking, you know, it's amazing, you know, and uh, and he began to to act uh, in those plays, amazing plays. You know, the room was packed full of, of people. I remember when Baraka came out, we used to do Wednesdays where we invited all of the, the students of color, the black students to come in and we would do a program. But we got them there because we fed them. Because students are always hungry, my sister. Always hungry. <laughs> and we had this great buffet uh, of, of food, and they would eat with their plates. And then um, they introduced Baraka and myself um, uh, to read. And it was like, uh, I mean, like we, we're from New York. You know, my sister, you know, we know we hit, you know, we knew, we know we is bad, whatever. And we're reading back and forth. And he read something, I fall out, and I said, whoa, yeah, whatever. And we did this amazing reading. And people clapped, then a hand went up and said, um, uh, um, um, uh, Mr. Jones, because he hadn't changed his name yet. Mr. Jones, uh, uh, Ms. Sanchez, uh, would you mind rereading what you did? Because you all were reading so fast, we didn't catch everything that you said. And then for the first time I realized the difference, you know, on the East Coast here, we speak fast, my sister. You know, we, we, do, a new, we do a mighty pace. And in California, they didn't speak that fast. When I crossed the campus uh, at San Francisco State, they always kept saying to me, slow down. I said, what do you mean? I'm not going. For I mean, I was like walking with my briefcase going to the uh, to the next class, whatever. Uh, I We spoke fast, whatever. And the great thing that hip hop, you know, and the rappers did by their music going all over America and the world, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you didn't have to slow down. When I used to go to the Midwest, I would remember to read at a slower pace, whatever. But when that hit everybody in America, you didn't have to slow down, my sister, you know, because their ears had become attuned to the fast pace, you know, of rap. Yeah. You, you know, so therefore they were then attuned to the fast pace of our poetry. So there we were at San Francisco State, you know, uh, doing that kind of work out there. It was an amazing time in history and history. The first class I taught, Black Lit, my sister, I walked into the classroom. People had pulled chairs from other rooms, <laughs> right? It was so crowded, I could barely get to my desk, right? People were sitting around on on um, uh, the room had like these blackboards all around, but then they had like a place for the chalk. People were sitting up on the edge of that little seat, whatever. People were sharing seats, say, come on, you can, you can sit next to me, whatever. I mean, it was packed. And I got up and wrote on the board. I went around the room, all these black names, my sister, and they, the class only knew two. And that was, that was Malcolm and Martin. Right. No Du Bois, no, no White, you know, you know, nothing about folk tales, you know, uh, you know, nothing about Zora Neale Hurston, you know, uh, you know, nothing about Langston Hughes, whatever. And that's what we did, whatever. Ah, oh, 
you know, what a joy that was, you know. I mean, people sitting there with their notebooks and in trance and not moving. And when the time was off, they didn't want to leave. You know, you were always over. But a class was always coming in. And I remember the professor said, I can never get this class out, you know. And where did all these chairs come from? I, I, I said, I would say, I don't know, <laughs> you know. Uh-huh. Right. And we would leave, but that was the, the beauty and the excitement that these young people were learning about themselves, which meant then that they were going to stay in school, which meant then that they were going to feel good about themselves. What meant then is that they, they knew they could learn because yeah. everybody had told them in high school they couldn't learn a bloody thing, whatever. You know, they couldn't go to college because they weren't smart enough. And here they were, you know, in college, you know, period. Yeah. Your writing has always been a part of movements, whether it's you were involved in the Black Panther Party, um, Mm -hmm. when you were involved with the with the nation, the Mm -hmm. Black Arts Movement. Mm -hmm. You've always your writing has always been a part of movements. Do you think that it is the responsibility like with the uh, Black aesthetic uh, theory that it is the responsibility of the writer to for the liberation of our people, that they should be using the power of the pen to liberate our people. What are your thoughts? Well, I think uh, many of our greatest writers have done that. I mean, many of the greatest writers in the world have done that, right? You know, it's not just uh, in terms of Black folk uh, doing it, right? Um, but, you know, people like Neruda, you know, uh, uh, Gillian in Cuba, you know, uh, you know, all these great Latin American writers were doing the same thing, right? Writing these beautiful poems, um, you know, supporting liberation. Uh, so therefore, uh, you know, being in a place, I, I don't know if I told you that, that when I uh, graduated from college, you know, my father said, you know, until you get this job teaching and before you go to grad school in September, we graduate in January from Hunter College, right? He said, you need to get a job. So I answered all these ads, right? And I would go down and they'd look at me and said, there are no jobs, whatever, so all the jobs taken. So I remember my dad said, well, I'll get the New York Times and you can answer some ads, you know. So I sent an example of my writing um, because this ad, this ad asked, say, we need a writer for our firm. So I sent a sample of my writing, a, a CV, right, right? And that was it. I got a telegram. Probably your younger audi- audience will not know what a telegram is. But it is something that somebody, you know, in a suit will ring your bell on a Saturday and have you sign for this little yellow envelope and you open up. And the yellow envelope said, report to work on Monday at 9 a.m. I had a job. And I, I, I got that. I, my, my father, who said, you'll never get a job writing for a firm. I took that telegram, right? And I said, look, 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 look at it. Look at that. Report to work at 9 a.m., whatever. Had the dress and everything. And I ran out of the house that came in the morning. And I got my suit, my little suit pressed, you know, at the cleaners. And I had on a, my, a blue suit and blue heels and stockings and a hat sitting AC Ducey, right? And a blue purse and white gloves going downtown to get this job. And I got that at 8.30. And the door was locked, right? So I waited and I heard these heels clicking down. It it was a secretary. um, I guess she was, yes, she was a secretary. She said, yes, can I help you? And I went in my purse and handed her the telegram. And she read the telegram and she looked at me. She read the telegram and she looked up me again. And she read the telegram for a third time. And she looked at me, she handed it back and said, Oh, and she opened the door and she told me to have a seat. And I sat down and I, I'm thinking, oh, well, look at this place, you know. But it, it was, uh, the, the, I guess the rest of the place was behind doors. We were only in this kind of foyer, you know, with the foyer, with the, with the place she sat with the typewriter and everything. She got up, left and came back. She took this, this top of the, this old fashioned typewriter. She got some letters, she started typing. And I saw a head come around the door It went back. I saw another head come around the door and went back and found that this guy walked in and said, yes, can I help you? And I took that. I still had it out. 
And I am like looking like this saying, here this is. The telegram that says, report to work. He read it. I, I, I'm, it's so, I'm telling the truth. He looked at me. He read the telegram again. He looked at me again. I mean, it's just like it didn't compute. He read it again and he looked up at me, seeing my black face and he had it. He said, I'm sorry, the job is taken. Well, you know, I come from New York with this New York humor, you know, but we're famous for humor. So I said to him, I got it. It said, a report at 9 a.m. I got here at 8.30. So I'm going to go out the door, right? I said, it's, it's almost 9 o'clock. I will return at 9 a.m. and we'll be okay. He didn't laugh. He didn't say, okay, whatever. I turned. He said, I said, the job is taken. I said, well, how can it be taken when I got here at 8.30? He said, the job is taken. That's all there is to it. And he turned to leave. And I said, I got it. I said, discrimination. I'm going to report you to the Urban League. And he turned and shrugged his shoulders and said, lady, you know, whatever. And I walked out. I was taking my hat off, my gloves off, everything off, you know. And I'm walking to the subway. And I got on the train, the express that would take you to 96th Street. You have to get off of 96th Street to stay on the west side. But I'm sitting there bemoaning my fate thinking, oh my goodness, I was going to come home and tell my father I had a job, right? And and the door was closing and I realized I had missed my stop. And that train that I was on went to the east side, would put you off at Lenox, right? You know, so we went all the way to uh, 116th, 125th, and then 135th, and I got off the train and I crossed the street and I got in about maybe a quarter of the block and there was a sign that said Schomburg. And there was a guy outside taking a quick smoke and I said to him, sir, uh, sir, what is the Schomburg? He said, lady, if you wanna know, go inside, sign the book and go up the steps and you'll see. And I did that, signed the book, went up the steps and I went, came into this vast room and this amazing long, long table and nothing but black men were sitting there with books stacked high, you know, and there was a, 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 a door behind that, a glass door. And that's where Miss Hudson was. And I knocked on the door and she was the curator, you know, and I, uh, she, and she always told this story with a, with a, with a smirk on her face. Cause there's a punchline on this one with the, and she just, uh, she loved me and I loved her also. And uh, I knocked on the door and I told her my name and she said, my name is Jean Hudson. Uh, uh, I am the curator here, right, in charge of the Schomburg. I said, well, what is the Schomburg? She said, oh, my dear. <laughs> I can still hear her say, she said, oh, my dear. Uh, in this library, the Schomburg, we have nothing but books by and about the Negro, <laughs> right? And I said with my smart mouth, there must not be many books in here, huh? <laughs> she <laughs> Every time I brought my class, I was teaching at Amherst, we, we, we rent a bus and we, I bring him down to the Schomburg for study, you know, and she would be standing up front and I would move away from the students to the back and she would say with a smile, oh, Professor Sanchez brings all her students to the Schomburg every semester. Let me tell you a little story about Professor Sanchez. <laughs> she was... And she told that all my students said, oh, they, was, they shook their hands. Oh, we got something on you, Professor Sanchez, whatever. Um, she was a wonderful woman. But that is, you know, how I sat down. She told me to sit down. She was going to bring me some books. And I sat down. I remember looking at my watch. 20 minutes had passed, and she brought three books. Up from Slavery, Souls of Black Folk, the top one, Their Eyes Are Watching God. I started reading the eyes of watching God, but you know, it's in black, black English. And I always tell young, young teachers, it's not dialect, it's black English. Okay. Uh, uh, so in this black English, and it took time for me, although we blacks also speak black English sometimes, but it took a minute for me to, you know, to really have the brain pick up exactly what I was reading. And so I read about a, a quarter of the book and I pushed my seat out and I went and knocked on her door again. 
I had tears in my eyes. I said, what's your name again? She said, Miss Hudson. I said, how could I have a college degree and never come across this? She said, oh, my dear, my dear. She said, I'm going to give you loads and lots and lots of books. Go sit down. So I inch back in and I opened the book. You know, I turned it over and I start reading again. And I got about a third in the book and I was almost sobbing. I was crying. I eased up again, knocked on the door again. I said, no, 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 no. I'm a college graduate in New York City. You know, I said, I'm going to grad school in, in, in the fall. How could I not have come across this? She said, oh, she said, that's a long story. And as you read this book and you keep coming back, I would tell you that story also too. But I go sit down and read. And when I got ready to enter in, this African scholar said, Miss Hudson, tell this young woman, either she, st she sits still or she has to leave the library. And I sat still. And every day I would tell my dad, I'm going out looking for a job, dad, right? You know, I need some coffee and some money for lunch. And I went to the Schomburg and she fed me. And when I finished that, what I call that sojourn, that, that, that period of study, she gave me two bags of books, you know, all black books, all the people I had read, my dear sister. You know, I had to take a cab home from the Schomburg, right? You know, um, you know, and uh, and there I was with those books, and I and I spread them out on my bed, you know, and I started reading those books. But she sent me to to um, uh, the other uh, person I call this name, uh, uh, um, um, the hey. brother of the books to 125th Street, right? Um, and, and there's another brother who's a Caribbean, uh, uh, Brother Richard, it's Caribbean bookstore. And I walked in and the, his bookstore was so narrow, right? You could barely get in it, right? And uh, he was up on one of those rollers and he said, yes, can I help you with his heavy accent? And I said, uh, Miss Hudson sent me. Uh, he said, oh, yes, 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 yes. What's your name? I told him. He said, I got... a." bags of books for you to take. It was all about the Blacks of the Caribbean, you know, right? Uh, and it was amazing. And I used to go to that bookstore, Brother Rich's bookstore, because he had uh, uh, Caribbean stu students from NYU. They went mostly to NYU, right? Uh, maybe, yeah, not NYU, um, City College. Uh, uptown, right? And many went to NYU also too, but these were all from City College and they would have, he would have people from the Caribbean uh, speaking, right? Um, and so therefore I would go, I started going in there listening to these these great writers uh, speak, but you know, that's, that's how I, I got, and he also had for me two big bags of books. I had to take a cab home again with books for me to read. So therefore, so I was totally prepared, prepared on many levels to teach. And I remember um, uh, I was in New York Corps. I said, we always had a party. We worked hard, but we would party on a Friday, you know? And I would go to the Palladium on a Saturday, you know, to hear all those people, you know, uh, playing that great music. And I remember at a party on Riverside Drive, right? I was talking to one of the brothers in, you know, in, in Corps. And I, I started talking about the speech I heard Malcolm get. And he swung me out when I turned around, he was gone. Right, <laughs> because you didn't talk about Malcolm. We were civil rights people, you know. We were in New York Corps, whatever. Um, and I remember in in a poem I wrote uh, about that period. Woke up to the rise and wind of history. I was alone, whatever. I, then I had to begin to search for people who were like me. You understand what I'm saying? Who thought like I thought, and 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 that search also then will take me, you know, to the Black Arts Movement, you know, and you know, and to all those great writers and musicians who came in there, right? You know, and the people who did programs there for students, whatever. Uh, that was our motion and movement, um, and it was a, a glorious, glorious time, my dear sister, uh, to go at night and hear the musicians. And at that at that place in Harlem on a Saturday, on a Friday and Saturday night, lines would be all around the corner, people lining up to come in to hear the musicians or to hear people read poetry, right? Or to see a short play by Baraka. It was amazing what that was really all about, you know? Yeah. 
can only imagine. And then now look, all these all these years later, here are you with a um, you know, with a, an amazing body of work, and now we have collective um the collected poems of Sonia Sanchez. How did that book come together? What was the and not and not all of them, you know, just uh because they could tell me that the book could only be just so many pages. So, you know, so not all the all the poems in here. But uh I the press that I published my poetry with is Beacon Press, right? Um and so uh, they asked for some collected poems. And so it's from all my first books, you know, all the way to uh, the last book that I did with them called Morning Haku, right? Mm -hmm. And they're all in here, all the poems are in here. Um, and and there are, um, um, you know, they're, they're all, um, you know, people, you know how people give praise for, for, for the book, you know? So they have, uh, I have, uh, comments from Sister Maya, you know, who said, this world is a better place because of Sonia Sanchez, more livable, more laughable, more manageable. I wish millions of people knew that some of the joy in their lives comes from the fact that Sonia Sanchez is writing poetry, you know. Mm -hmm. And Joe Harjo, who is now our poet laureate now of the United States, a Native American, you know, a, a, a first person, uh, people. Uh, wrote her songs of destruction and loss scrape the heart her praise songs thunder and revitalize we need these songs for our journey together into the next century you know and other people Chinua Achebe and Amiri Baraka and Toni Morrison you know will all uh you know say some words about the book Right. I'm, I'm, I have it on my phone. Um, <laughs> I'm seeing it on my phone because I, um, my book is arriving today. Oh, how nice. How nice. Right. You know, yeah. yeah. You know, the poem that's, that's making noise with a lot of uh, uh, young people right now is Catch the Fire. Um, that, was on, um, that was on HBO. You know, when they did the, the program about Tulsa being bombed, you know, and what was so amazing is that that I'm reading the poem and this sister, you know, who has been protected so she can walk through the fire, you know, because she's going to come back in time. Right. Um, she's walking and you hear me reciting that poem. Yeah. But then after that, you hear this sister who has this mm -hmm. back Magnificent voice begins to sing the poem, and we are listening in 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 the family room. And I didn't know it had happened that way, and we just cried. Her that voice is magical, huh? That was the first time you heard it with with all of us watching. Yeah, yeah I hadn't I hadn't heard it before that she begins to sing that operatic your voice because people will call me have your has your poem have your poems ever been put together in an operatic fashion because of the amazing woman who wrote the music also did it and i said yes out of this country you know uh much m much of our work as black arts people that they put them in operas you know that they would put baraka and 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 and, and bob and and all of us you know uh together you know uh haki all of us together, you know, in these uh, uh, operas, you know, they would use our words uh, and they would do this great operatic thing. Um, it, it was utterly amazing. Larry Neal, I mean, we were all in there together. Um, and so I said, no, it was not the first time when people called me, but it was beautiful. And that sister who sang that, uh, that, that song was just like, I mean, you just got, you dissolved in, in, in tears for the fact that they were dropping a bomb, yeah. you know, for the first time on an American city, right? Um, the second time would be in Philadelphia, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. and, um, and, uh, and you see her, you know, uh, she's the future, you know? Uh, what's so fascinating about uh, that, that part number nine, it, it was a 10, 10, um, uh, part series, you know, uh, about, you know, Tulsa, Oklahoma. N number nine, they show also that Blacks have always been able to go go into outer space and jump through time. That was utterly amazing, whatever. And I've always said to people that I love two jazz singers, Ella Fitzgerald, right, and Sarah Vaughan, right. I, I said, but Ella's songs, I mean, she could, she, her, her voice was, was a voice of a, an instrument, 
right? I mean, she could do anything with her voice, right? But I said, Ella's feet were always planted firmly on this earth. I said, but Sarah was singing. And she had many octaves, right? And all of a sudden you close your eyes and listen to Sarah. Sarah has taken you to outer space. Mm -hmm. you know? And you are sailing with her voice as she did magic things, magical things with that voice, going from high to all the way low. And there you were. And then the only thought you had is that, will she get me back safely to earth? <laughs> Right, you know, as she did that magical kind of thing, just completely magical, right? Um, um, yeah. So yeah. amazing, mm -hmm. amazing. Um, I could I could talk to you all day, but I know you. I know you're with this book tour. You are um, you are really tired too, as well, because they've got you doing everything. Everyone wants to speak to you. Uh, you want me to catch the fire. I wasn't sure. Did you want me to read the poem Catch a Fire for people who didn't hear it? Or, may, or we, maybe you should just tell them to, to catch uh, number nine. Um, if you would, if look, I would, I, yes, please. You know, I thought, I know, you know, I realized I pulled out, <laughs> I realized I pulled out the, uh, it's so funny, you know how you get organized. I pulled out the, the, the bookmark. <laughs> when stuck, it, you're looking for it, when I would get stuck in, um, you know, writing up the concept for this show, Lit Lounge, Literary Lounge. And um, when I heard Catch the Fire, actually before I actually oh. saw it on um, HBO, it would be inspiration for me. You know, and when you speak yeah. about all these that things. Was Those, the, the sister who wrote, who wrote the music, right? And the sister who sang it, right? You know, I called them and asked them that I said, I wanted, you know, a copy uh, because that's something I just would like to just hear. Yeah. You know, so again, my mornings with sometimes, you know, um, because it is so beautiful. The singing and the music are just really, really beautiful. Um, and I will, you know, I'm going back to the uh, to each to each book that I did, and I think it's in um, uh, I think it's in this book here. Uh, I'm sorry that I, I pulled the, I pulled, here it is. It's from a book called Wounded in the House of a Friend. Um, and it's on page 248 in the collection. But I, I don't think I have Wounded in the House of a Friend. Oh, yes, I do. It's in Wounded in the House of a Friend. Um, yeah, yeah. And in here, uh, it's in this book. Uh, maybe I should read, from, should I read from the book? Or from the what? what new book. Yeah, yeah. The new book. Okay, I'll read from the new book. But right. it's in there. Yeah. So it's in, it's on page two forty eight. And I just every time I read it now, I I just wish for the music. Sometimes I wonder what to say to you now, in the soft afternoon air, as you hold us all in a single death. I say, where is your fire? I say, where is your fire? You got to find it and pass it on. You got to find it and pass it on from you to me, from me to her, from her to him, from the son to the father, from the brother to the sister, from the daughter to the mother, from the mother to the child. I say, where is your fire? Can't you smell it coming out of our past? The fire of living, not dying. The fire of loving, not killing. The fire of blackness, not gangster shadows. Where is our beautiful Beautiful fire that gave light to the world, the fire of pyramids, the fire that burned through the holes of slave ships and made us breathe, the fire that made guts into chitlins, the fire that took rhythms and made jazz, the fire of sit-ins and marches that made us jump boundaries and barriers, the fire that took street talk and sounds and made righteous imhope tech raps. I say, where is your fire? The torch of life full of Nzinga and Nat Turner and Garvey and Du Bois and Fanny Lou Hamer and Martin and Malcolm and Mandela. Sister, sister, brother, brother, come, come catch 
your fire don't kill. Hold your fire don't kill. Learn your fire don't kill. Be the fire don't kill. Catch the fire and burn with eyes that see our souls walking, singing, building, laughing, learning, loving, teaching, being. Hey, 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 young, young, young brother, brother, hey, young sister, sister, here is my hand. Catch, catch, catch. Catch, catch, catch the fire and live, 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 It's a poem, yeah. Mm-hmm. And she does the music behind that, you know, so I'm, um, you know, I think they're going to make a record of the music. It's so, uh, they said, you know, it's so, and so we'll be able to hear it also too. Mm-hmm. I, I have lived, I have lived, I've, I've heard you recite this poem. Um, what would you just, what would you say to the young poets who, um, and us living in this time right now, what would you say to them to encourage them to keep writing? Uh, you must write because we need the words. Uh, we need your young words. We need uh, what you're thinking about. We need your leadership also too. Um, uh, you must continue to write because there's so many people to teach. So many people need to hear the voices and the words, the words of support, the words of love, the words that says we are, we are, we are, we are those people that the world has been waiting for. Uh, so yes, and when I was in China in 73, I called home to my children and I said to them, hi, Mungu Marani, it's Monday and mommy and all the rest of the people, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, all these movie stars that were there with us and, and writers who were there in the San Francisco mime troupe also, I said, we're going to climb the Great Wall of China. And I said, so it's Monday. And I heard the children turn to the Aunt Sarah and said, Aunt Sarah, mommy thinks it's Monday, but it's really Sunday. You see, I was in China, I was in the East, and I was greeting the day before my children even got the day. So mm-hmm. on the way to the to climb the Great Wall, I wrote a haku that said, let me wear the day well, so when it reaches you, you will enjoy it. It was important for me to wear the day well in the East. So by the time that they got that day, uh, they would be obliged to wear it well. And that night, as I read my poetry at the University of Beijing, I ended up with the haku. And one, and I said, let me wear the day well, so when it reaches you, you will enjoy it. One of the officials stood up and said, ah, oh, Professor Sanchez, if we here in the East learn how to wear our days well, by the time you get the same day in the West, perhaps we will have peace. That is the joy always of a haku. The underbelly of a haku is always about peace and beauty, you know, peaceful actions, peaceful movements, and the beauty of each one of us as human beings. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, thank you is not even adequate. Thank you, my dear sister. Um, For everything you have uh, done for all of us, Uh, your writing, it's comforted us, it's encouraged us um, it's it's contributed to movements it's mm-hmm. taught us things it's given us blueprints so many things about your life that there are such an inspiration to me that you've lived through it and then you've you know you've been through and contributed your gift um, to movements and therefore enriched us and made us made us walk with our backs a little wider and taller and stronger and especially as black women remind us who we are and our magic um just because you you decided to follow your gift and because you decided to be and um, i want you to know that you're a great inspiration uh i'll be i'll be flying for the rest of i don't know the year (laughs) with even speaking with you um your new book is um, Collected Poems of Sonia Sanchez. Um, is it, <clears throat> it's now out. And it's you- coming out, it's today the, um, I, I think it's, uh, I think it's coming out uh, on Tuesday, I think on the 12th 
I mean, what, no, we're on, uh, what are we? We're the 10th today. Yesterday was the 9th, right? So I think it would be on the 10th, 11th, or 12th, right? But it's on its way, right? Yes. Uh -huh. We yeah. can pre-order it. We can order it. We can, um, you know, put you put you on the times. Do, do We just need to celebrate you. Um, Thank you. I appreciate that. Five years young or 86 years young? Yes, that's yeah. right. 86, I mean, yes. And, and we, we must continue to do this work, you know, at uh, 39, at 24, at 18, you know, at 15, you know, at 86. Uh, and as our dear sister did, 96, you know, uh, yes, you know, before she made transition, you know. Uh, that's the beauty of all of this, right? That we work, you know, always we work. Uh, it is about work. It's about saying to people, you must learn how to love yourselves because we must answer finally the most important question if we are to save this earth and each other. What does it mean to be human? You gotta answer that question in this century, okay? Thank you, my dear sister. Thank you so much. Look forward to, to coming down to see this that beautiful library, all right? You are welcome anytime, anytime. A library changed uh, the course of uh, Sonia Sanchez's life. So I'm so happy to be interviewing you here um, at the MLK mm -hmm. Library downtown DC, another activist named after another activist. So uh, you definitely have to bless this theater, the new theater, um, when all of this COVID stuff is over. You are- Oh, that'd be, more than that'd be wonderful. I look forward to that, my sister. Stay safe now on your travels, okay? okay. Take care. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Literary Lounge, and I hope you are as full as I am. I mean, to have Sonia Sanchez read to us, Catch the Fire, that in itself was special. That in itself, I could have been done. But I hope you got from this episode that there is power in the pen and that if you have that gift, if you have a gift of writing, keep writing because you never know what change your writing can do, your book can make. You never know. So keep writing and, you know, we want you to join us here for the next episode because you never know what you'll be inspired to do. The Lit Lounge. Thank you for joining us. Hi, I'm Asia with the DC Public Library. Click subscribe and enjoy great content for you and your family here at the DC Public Library YouTube channel. DC Public Library, find your story.